Most people know Ralph Nader as the insurgent third-party presidential candidate in the 2000 elections, where the popularity of his stand against corporate hegemony struck fear into establishment politics. But hundreds of millions experience Nader's legacy every day. Most notably, how virtually every automobile safety measure, from seatbelts to airbags, is the product of his relentless campaign against auto industry giants, saving millions of lives. A longtime political figure and consumer advocate with a unique experience fighting from the center of Washington, I wanted to hear what he had to say about today's political climate. Uh, so your main focus early on, of course, in your political career was the auto industry, where you heavily critiqued their safety standards. General Motors went after you pretty hard. I wanted you to outline the insane tactics that the industry employed against you. Well, they had a habit. Uh, they had hired uh, former FBI agents who retire on their security staff. So anybody who criticized them and got it through the media, they'd send a, a detective to get dirt on them. So I guess I was just in line, and they sent uh, detectives to trail me. They trailed me to Iowa, uh, where the Attorney General of Iowa was holding auto safety hearings. They, they stubbed their toe, though, when they trailed me up to the new Senate office building. I was scheduled to testify for Congress in a few days. And you see, if you obstruct a congressional witness, that's a felony. So the guard caught, uh, he caught them. And uh, uh, Senator Rokoff had hearings. Senator Bobby Kennedy was on the show, uh, on the hearings rather. And uh, they summoned the president of General Motors, who admitted it. And that created a huge wave to enact the 1966 uh, Motor Vehicle and Highway Safety Laws, which uh, irregularly enforced have saved over three million lives. How hard would it be to pass similar legislation today? It would be hard because there have now been like 65 million cars recalled in the last couple of years uh, from domestic and foreign manufacturers, Toyota, um, Honda, General Motors, uh, VW, Diesel. And it still is not enough to get bills sponsored by Senator Blumenthal and Senator Markey to put the criminal penalty in the Auto Safety Act. They got it out of it in 1966. That's one of the battles we lost. So for willful and knowing sale of defective motor vehicles that are killing and injuring people, there's no criminal penalty. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's not moving in Congress. So it's, it, this is the worst Congress probably uh, in uh, well over a century in terms of being indentured both to a rigid ideology that is enslaved by corporatism, uh, giant corporate uh, power. We should never use the word government unless we use the word corporate government because Wash Wall Street has taken over w Washington more than any time in our history. They put their high executives in government positions like Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense. They, they fund uh, both parties in terms of campaign contributions. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, tons of lobbyists working full time while the consumer and worker has very few. So they turn the government against its own people because the one force that can prosecute these big corporations, that can countervail them, that can expose them is the government. So they're working over time, decade after decade, to create the corporate state. Let's talk about uh, your experience uh, running for president, Michael Moore endorsed you. I remember at, at your rally, he said the lesser of two evils is still evil. He's right. up there. And then, you know, him and Bill Maher on their knees, embarrassingly groveling to you, begging for you not, not to run in 2004. Um, what happened? Oh, they got cold feet, to put it metaphorically. What happened was that they, they saw the Green Party, in their interpretation, as, quote, taking enough votes to throw the election to the Republicans uh, in Florida. But of course, that's factually deprived because uh, as Al Gore is the first to realize there are all kinds of sine qua non reasons he lost the election. He lost his home state of Tennessee. Who would do that? Uh, he, he didn't allow uh, Clinton to campaign in Arkansas. Just if he got Arkansas, he'd be president. 
Uh, and in uh, uh, Florida, all kinds of uh, shenanigans, as we know, fiddling around with thousands of uh, people and labeling them ex-felons, couldn't vote because they had names like uh, ex-felons did, the butterfly ballot, uh, the shenanigans in southern Florida, the uh, Supreme Court ruling uh, Republican 5, Democrat 4, 5-4 to stop the Florida Supreme Court from continuing uh, the recount uh, and on and on. And, you know, he knows why he lost. You never say, oh, the Green Party took votes away. Uh, I think Bush took more votes away from Gore, right? They like to use the third parties as a scapegoat, so they don't like to look at themselves in the mirror because the Democrats uh, have been dialing for the same dollars. They're indentured to the same corporate interests. They become very cautious, and they can't even make an issue out of one bad vote after another that the Republicans pass through the House of Representatives because, oh, we might not get this uh, 50000 bucks from this interest or 100000 So they wouldn't even go forward with the minimum wage, which is the cardinal issue of the Democratic Party going back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt until a few years ago. Now they're sort of timid about it. Hillary Clinton didn't uh, come out for a higher minimum wage, which is frozen now at seven and a quarter per hour, till May of 2014. The last prominent Democrat to jump on the $10.10 minimum wage being proposed by Democrats in Congress, even after letters were sent to her from women's groups, from children's groups, please, Hillary, come out for it, come out for it. She was deemed having to figure out how can she maintain her contacts with Wall Street and yet come out for this constituency that she claims she's been championing, uh, single mothers and children who are the worst victims of a frozen minimum wage. Yeah, and of course, none of the minimum wage stuff would have happened without the massive grassroots campaign, yeah. you know, the fight for 15. So that's really and, why. And by the way, that, that teaches us another lesson. Yeah. It's not that massive. It's less than the population of New Britain, less than 70,000 workers, picket, picketed, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart. Then we had some think tanks and our groups, for example, putting out the materials and then the press covering it. Look, they've turned the thing around. Uh, Congress hasn't yet got the message, but a lot of cities and states are increasing the minimum wage. They've turned it around, and I keep saying it's a lot easier than we think to turn it around. When you're pushing for a good change for our country that's supported by a majority of the people, left-right support by workers on minimum wage increase, for example, uh, it doesn't take that many people to turn it around. Um, back, to the, back to the election and this kind of rhetoric that reinforces the two-party dictatorship, uh, you, you know, it, it's funny that people don't blame the antiquated Electoral College. They don't blame Gore for not fighting the Supreme Court on that decision more. Do you just feel like punching people in the face when they still tell you that they blame you? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Well, uh, it, it, you can't argue with them because they don't want to listen. They'll come up to you and they'll say, uh, you cost Gore the election. And I say, well, let's discuss it. And they just walk away. It's a total <laughs> closed mind. You see, because it's what I call one-step thinking, which is impulsive. They don't go and say, oh, really? How many other conditions, any one of which he had control of, that, that was bungled by the Democratic Party, which would have put him uh, in the White House? Uh, but take the Electoral College. Uh, th there's a man in San Francisco. He uh, runs a foundation, Steve Silberstein. He decided a few years ago to hire six or seven people full time and get rid of the Electoral College not by constitutional amendment, by just getting one state after another passing a law saying that we will throw our electoral votes to whoever wins the national vote. The moment enough states pass these laws to get the 270 electoral votes, that's all you need to win, you know, the presidency. Well, he's at 165. He's gotten California to pass the law, New York to pass the law, Maryland to pass the law. And if he gets to 270, Never again will a presidential candidate come in second in the popular vote and win the election. What other country allows that kind of bizarre result? Now, this is one person and a half a dozen full-time people. That's incredible. It's easier than we think to turn it around. Well, how much is the entire electoral process rigged from top to bottom as someone who is on the inside for so long? And, I mean, the Electoral College is just obviously one yes. facet of that. Hugely rigged. First of all, you ever see a country that calls itself a democracy 
where the politicians pick the voters instead of the voters pick the politicians, that's called gerrymandering. So if the Democrats dominate one state politically or Republicans dominate another, they carve it up with their computers, look like snakes, you know, the congressional district, so that they can uh, more likely win. That's, that's, that should be a crime. The politicians pick the voters. Uh, whoever happens to win the governorship and the state legislature. A second is they keep all challengers off the debates, third party challengers. Uh, th therefore, there's no competitive democracy. Without a competitive democracy, you can't have a democracy. Third, they're not changing the, the m role of money in politics. And so they're dialing for the same dollars, Republican, Democrat, they dial for Walmart dollars, Exxon dollars, they di dial for uh, banking dollars, insurance dollars. So, you know, he who pays the piper plays the tune. The fourth is that they crush the third parties from getting on the ballot. It's all exhausting to get on the ballot in most states. Some states are okay, they're pretty easy. New Jersey, Tennessee, pretty easy. But try North Carolina, try Texas, try California, uh, even Virginia, very, very hard to get on the ballot. So if candidates can't get on the ballot, uh, that means voters don't have enough choices. So the rights of candidates to get on the ballot provides meaning for the voter because they can have choice of candidate and agenda. That's just the beginning of how our electoral system has been rigged by a two-party duopoly or a two-party dictatorship. When did they change the rules about the debates? Well, the debates used to be run until 1988 by the legal women of voters. And the two parties thought that the league was too uppity. It wasn't uh, controlled enough. So they created a commission on presidential debates. Sounds official. It's just a private corporation, a toy in the hands of the two parties, Republican, Democrat. And guess what? They decide, the two parties decide, one, how many debates there are going to be. So they only have about three. They decide what reporters to pick, uh, which in effect pretty much decides what kind of questions are going to be asked. Uh, they decide who's going to fund it. And Anheuser-Busch is one funder. AT&T is another funder. Ford Motor Company. It's hard to make it up, right? Um, and as a result, uh, they keep uh, third parties from having a chance to have a chance. Third party candidates cannot grow. I mean, I, I campaigned in 2000. I filled every major stadium. I mean, you know, every major uh, convention hall, like uh, the Boston Garden, Madison Square Garden, the Target Center, and Minneapolis, and, and others. And I only reached 2% of the people that I could have reached had I been on just one of the three debates. National polls, including the Fox poll, had me to be on the debates. They supported me and Pat Buchanan to get on the debates. Maybe they wouldn't be voting for us, but uh, they didn't want to fall asleep. Well, Bernie Sanders has already said that he will endorse Hillary Clinton at the end of the day and also that he won't run as an independent. It seems like that's pretty crazy considering his swell of support. Why do you think he would do that? Well, he wants to hold on to his committee assignments because he, you know, he's getting seniority now. He doesn't want to be ostracized. He's often said, I don't want to do what Ralph Nader did. He made a bad mistake when he was asked a few months ago, are you going to endorse the Democratic nominee? He said, I always endorse the Democratic nominee for president. What he should have said is, it depends on who the nominee is. So he lost his bargaining chips, in effect. And uh, he probably knows that the Democratic Party machinery is controlled by the Clintons. The primary details and procedures and uh, all that is heavily in the Clintons' hands. And that he's going to just change the conversation in the country, pay attention to Main Street over Wall Street, drug prices, other things like that, uh, minimum wage increase, stronger unions. And by April, he's done. And what is he going to do? He's got millions of people supporting him. He's got more money than any other insurgent candidate has ever had. He'll probably end up uh, raising $80 million, which is way more than he ever dreamed. Uh, and suddenly, he's up there on the stage holding Hillary, uh, saying, you know, I endorse uh, I, Bernie Sanders, endorse Hillary Clinton. What is that going to do to all these millions of people? Many of them young people. They're going to move into, you know, cynicism, withdrawal, disgust. It may actually damage the voter turnout. 
What I would suggest his followers do is basically say, Bernie, you are not going to endorse Hillary Clinton until she endorses your agenda. And she endorses it specifically, not with vague rhetoric. She says she's going to move for congressional hearings. She's going to have a deadline at when she is going to make certain proposals. And, and she's going to have regular meetings with your progressive constituency and not be a bubble, you know, surrounded by a bubble in the White House. Uh, that's the least that can be done, but I doubt whether it will be done. I mean, that's what we see right now. It all depends what his supporters do uh, quickly, uh, not wait until uh, all the primaries. They don't have that many weeks left to condition uh, Bernie Sanders. If he doesn't make it, if he doesn't defeat Hillary, he's got to condition his endorsement on the basis of this agenda. And he can give her 10 weeks to think about it. He can hold up. He can... All these unions are running to endorse Hillary. They have no bargaining power. Right. SEIU just endorsed them. The AFSCME is going to endorse them. Well, for heaven's sake, why don't you say to Hillary, uh, unless you come out to repeal the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which is an albatross around labor's neck, the worst anti-labor law in the Western world, uh, we are not going to endorse you. No, they just give it all in, lose all their bargaining power. She never looks back. Uh, so people have got to become more demanding as voters long before Election Day. Absolutely. And Hillary Clinton is really poised to be the next president of the United States, shockingly enough. I mean, before we get into her, how do you feel just about looking at the political landscape today? Are you just abhorred? Yeah, it's, it, it basically uh, comes out to this. If we're a great country, we should be led by great people. And we are not even led Donald by the. Trump's B not a good person. We're not even not being led man. by the B team. In 2012, <laughs> the, some Republicans said that the candidates in the primaries were the B team. I guess this is the D team or the E team. That we have these candidates who are like pulling each other down instead of Kasich, you know, separating himself. It's like who's going to make the most outrageous thing on refugees or on ISIS or on military expansion or. Uh, on uh, Wall Street uh, tax deductions. It's, just, it, it's like a, a race to the bottom. And the worst thing is like what Trump is doing. And he, he's bringing the worst out of people. Uh, you know, he's got like a 25% hardcore support. They're not all bad people, but if all you do is hit the nerve points where their latent prejudices come out and their rage come out, but more basically is they turn everybody, these candidates, into spectators. There's no role for the voters. There are no voters who say, you come to our town, Denver. We're going we're gonna to sponsor a debate. The voters, the Republican, Democrat voters are going to sponsor the debate. Uh, we're just told, look at the ads. Look at the insipid uh, parallel press interviews they call debates. And, uh, and, and go to the polls. Um, let's talk about Hillary Clinton. You called her a corporate criminal earlier. Um, you know, people have put her on par with John McCain in terms of hawkish foreign policy. What do you think? Oh, yes. Oh, she's never met a war she doesn't like. She actually shoved Secretary of Defense Robert Gates aside, went to the White House, and got the okay for the toppling of Libya's dictator, which now has led to unbelievable chaos through a huge part of Africa, including Libya, killing sectarian violence, uh, uh, more haters of America, uh, the uh, ISIS has now got a, a foothold in a town that was a hometown for Gaddafi. Uh, she should be held responsible for that. Uh, she's a warmonger. She's never met a weapon system she doesn't like. She was on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And as far as Wall Street, she's Wall Street's messenger. She's Wall Street's uh, uh, champion. She, you know, got huge speech fees. Uh, from Goldman Sachs, which is engaged in corporate criminal activity uh, over time uh, and uh, produces the Secretary of Treasury from time to time and other high government officials. So she's a militarist and a corporatist, really deep. Not what she was when she got out of Wellesley or she was a young lawyer uh, for civil rights or on the Watergate committee. She's completely changed. It's, it's the blind ambition of seeking power. And so you're going to have more wars. She's the one who spearheaded the pivot to Asia, which is basically forced projection against China, goading China so they enter into an arms race. She's never going to be the president of a peace race. This idea, oh, it's the first woman president. 
What does that mean? Right. I mean, you want that to mean something. You don't want it to mean uh, inheriting the male-dominated uh, machismo uh, of the military-industrial complex, which she has gone full-fledged uh, in support of. Under what legal pretense is the Clinton Foundation operating in where you can actually receive hundreds of millions of dollars from Gulf monarchies and then just have it cycled through your foundation and still be a legitimate political contender? It's not it? just Gulf monarchies. It's a pretty sleazy mining uh, magnates in Central a working in Central Asia out of Canada. The book by uh, uh, Peter Schweitzer it came out in early 2015 called Clinton Cash has this triangle you pointed out. That is $200,000, $500,000 speeches in foreign lands because these countries or their mining magnets or others, they want something from Hillary Clinton, who's Secretary of State and may have to produce uh, permits. Uh, it's that tr triangle. And, and in this book, uh, Clinton Cash, he points it out again and again in naming names and meetings and dates. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton's speeches began declining after a few years from from the White House, like most presidents do. But they took a huge surge upward uh, when she became Secretary of State. And so the, you got these mining magnets saying, okay, we want something from Hillary, uh, throw a million dollars or two million dollars to the Clinton Foundation. But it just shows how the Clintons think they're above the law. They're above uh, ethical standards. They can always get away with it because they're so, uh, so fluent. Uh, with their rationalizations and their evasions. This is where the country's going to end up for four or eight years. Bill, as the House husband, you know, the White House uh, uh, presence of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. What do they have really to offer the country? They can't even come out for some of the most fundamental changes. They supported the deregulation of Wall Street, for example. What, what, what do they have to offer the country? They're, they're full of cronies all around them. Uh, contracts given, you know, to their cronies, high positions. It seems like Hillary just thinks it's her due time. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. she's very cleverly every day is saying, uh, elect me, I'm going to be the first woman president. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like anything else. Uh, I advocated for women's rights back in the 1950s, so I have a long history of it, and for African-American rights when I was in law school. But I always thought this, Abby, that freeing African-Americans and women for full opportunity should be more than just an upward career move. It should convey something substantive in terms of democratizing power and advancing justice. If Trump wins the nomination, God forbid, and then you have Hillary Clinton, you know, as a Democratic front runner, what is your response to people who will inevitably say time and again and guilt everyone into voting for Hillary because how could we let Trump become president? Well, I don't think Trump is going to be the nominee because, first of all, he's going to push the envelope too far in some of these rallies and, and throw people out and they may get hurt and it just gets more uh, turbulent. And then you start uh, seeing, is this the brown shirts, you know, from fascist Europe? Uh, he's got to be very careful and, and he, sometimes he can't help himself. He can't control himself. Uh, so also there's more to come out of his business dealings. There's more to come out uh, from his background. He's not completely Teflon. He can't completely over-talk people when they're accusing him of something, an uh, interview on Meet the Press or whatever. Uh, and then remember, the Republican establishment knows that if he wins the nomination, it's, they're going to lose governorships, state legislatures, mayors all the way down, all over the country because he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the problem. You know, you ask him about any uh, major public issue policy, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. We'll, we're going to study that. And that begins to wear very, very thin and scare people that, you know, you might want him as a cheerleader. You might want him as a cabinet secretary. But you want someone with that temperament uh, as the president of the United States. So a message to people who are going to say the lesser of two evils, anyone but the GOP. Well, I, I, I believe voters should only vote for people they believe in. So if they believe in a libertarian candidate and a green candidate and Jill Stein, they should vote for that. Because that's the only thing that counts. Because if you are a tactical voter, you're going to fall into a trap of least worst. Well, I don't like the, 
Democrats, but the Republicans are worse. So I'm going to vote for the Democrat. But the minute you do that, you lose your bargaining power because the corporations are pulling on both parties 24-7. Think of a rope. And once you become a least uh, worse voter, there's no rope on the other side. You're not pulling them.